Ladies and gentlemen, open banking pioneers, hello and a big warm welcome and thank you for joining us around our campfire. Now, as you know, we create our content by listening to our global community. You told us you wanted to understand more about super apps. We heard you. So today our campfire is themed the race to become a super app, the challenges and the drivers. And we've gathered some world experts to talk with you. This is a hugely popular topic, maybe because we all have a personal connection to them. Already this morning, the questions have been flooding in and we will be covering everything that you've asked us to, so rest assured. So by way of starting our conversation, I'd like to refer you to a blog post that was written by Amit Malik um, from Accenture, and you'll be hearing a little bit more from him later. So on market sizing, Accenture say in China, WeChat, currently has about 1.24 billion um, active monthly users worldwide. Whilst Alipay has around 230 million users, albeit a different market landscape, it does clearly go to show the direction of travel. Outside of China, there are clearly some early leaders uh, um, emerging and we will be referencing those today. Now let's have a quick look, a high level look at the different models for super apps. We see two super app models emerging. The financial services winner takes all model, sounds a little bit like a, an ABBA song, doesn't it? But no, I'm not gonna sing. And the aggregator model. Companies taking the winner takes all model, um, they start by offering um, banking or other consumer finance services to build a devoted customer base and then gradually expand their offerings out and then, then offer additional services um, to their, their primary um, financial, their primary relationships. And good examples here would be Revolut, Square and Robinhood. Now companies, and this is an interesting one, that take the aggregator approach are creating digital experience layers or marketplaces to connect existing ecosystems of digital banking and financial services. So think Curve, PayPal, Google, Apple. Now, one common denominator is open banking. Essentially, any business has the potential to be a digital or to create a, a, a super app. Although a large customer base is clearly a prerequisite for creating a world-class leader. Now, the incredible rise of open banking is powering super apps to use financial data from multiple sources to target customers' needs and deliver financial products. This allows the platforms to, to deliver a range of services that accurately, and that's the key thing now with, with open banking as we move into open data, accurately target users. So let's take a headline look at what open banking actually delivers. It maximizes personalization, creating its own ecosystem that leverages customer data and a truly personalized experience. It also enhances the UX for a customer. Now, how often do we use that expression? It enhances the UX. But what do we really, really mean here? Well, it accesses everything on one platform. For you, for me, that use these super apps, it means that if the super app has access to open banking data, we can, as consumers, we can make payments. And I'm dying to hear what Amit has to say about this. We can check uh, account balances. We can monitor recent transactions. And we can then do everything on that app rather than using the bank's own app. And this is a beautiful segue into a question we had in this morning from our open banking pioneer and in Canada. And they said was, can you ask your panel who owns the customer? Now, I'm not sure if a customer actually wants to be owned and if that's aligned with open banking and democratizing uh, the data, but I, I, I get the, the meaning of the question. Now, this is an interesting one to explore and, and thank you for, for being proactive and actually getting in touch with us. Um, it's a battle really for the front end of, of how the customer will access uh, the, 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 the financial services. And this is a critical one. And rest assured, our, our panel will be talking this and all the other questions that you've sent us in. 
As open banking expands into open finance, open data, and, and far beyond, um, let's have a look at how that will connect us to a large number of, of partners and how that will, will speed up the market for new products. So it's, it's a hugely interesting time for open banking, open finance, and open data, and the role that this has to play for developing the super apps. So you bet that open banking has a key part to play in this space. Now, we all have a few trusty favorite super apps on our phones and possibly have already used some today. So hopefully I've set the scene for a fascinating campfire conversation. So please do join in. As you can see on the side of your screen, we've got Slido and what questions we can't answer, you know that we'll always get back to you. Now, talking of phones, and you'll know what I'm, where I'm going on this one, I would like you to lift your phone. And as you can see at the bottom of your screen, there is a charity QR code. I would like you to lift your phone and to please make an open banking charity donation. Now, all our charities are worthy causes, but I would just ask you to just take a moment and think of the poor people under siege or the brave people under siege in Mariupol um, and ask you to be very, very generous, please. Okay, so back to the warmth and the safety of our campfire. Here today, we're joined by Deval from London and Partners. Now, Deval and I have been saying for quite some time now that we wanted to do something. So I am absolutely delighted that we have this opportunity today. Now, Deval has an absolutely stellar cast as a lineup. We've got Amit from Accenture, who um, is here to talk about digital wallets and embedded finance. He's an absolute expert in these areas. So perfect for helping us, as you've asked to, to understand more. And we have Steve from Wise. Steve, all I have to say really to you is thank you. I use your app. Uh, my nephews in Colorado are very, very grateful that I do. You have kept them on the slopes. Uh, we pay our team around the, the world via your platform. So I can't wait to hear more. And neither can they, by the way. Uh, Phil from Evershed Sutherlands. We've had an overwhelming request to hear from a data expert. So thank you for joining us. Um, and I'm looking for a real deep dive on the, the gotchas and the potential bear traps. And uh, we've our old friend, Simon Torrance, who as always, no doubt, will come armed to the hilt uh, with uh, facts and figures and super use cases. So, Deval, over to you to jump straight into our campfire conversation. Deval, what is a super map? App, super Mac? I'm looking at a super Mac. What is a super app? Um, you've got the mic now. Probably as good, as probably a good time to pass over as I'm getting tongue tied. Deval, over to you. Thank you very much, Helen. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be hosting uh, the latest Open Banking Excellence Campfire session. Uh, as Helen said, my name is Deval, Deval Gore. I head up a scale up program at uh, London Partners called the Mayor's International Business Program. Uh, we support London's, uh, some of London's fastest growing tech firms with their international expansion plans and ambitions. Um, as Helen said, uh, over the next hour, we'll be discussing the hot topic that is super apps. Uh, what are their core elements shaping the emergence of super apps now in the future? Banks, big tech firms, social media apps, shopping apps, they're all hot favorite runners um, in the race to become a super app. Uh, the big question is, however, who will own the customers? And as I said before, uh, nobody wants to be owned. That's the term we're using and we'll be obviously debating that later. Um, so this discussion will focus on the emerging business models of super apps, why we need them, the environment in which they flourish, how they will leverage embedded finance, open banking, open finance payments, and the impact of e-commerce. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by a panel of experts who are going to share their insights and thoughts. Let me briefly introduce them again, um, as Helen did. Um, Amit Malik is the Managing Director, Global Open Banking and APIs Lead at Accenture. We've got Steve Nord, uh, Head of Product at WISE, uh, and we've got Simon Torrance, Embedded Finance Super App Strategies. Um, we do have the Slido, so we'll keep an eye on the chat and monitor questions and comments as they come in. Um, let me just start with an opening. Uh, when we think of uh, super apps, we clearly look east. China with WeChat, Ants, Alipay. Uh, we've got Southeast Asia with GoTo Group and Grab. Korea has Kakao, Japan has Line. We've even got Latin America, which is also seeing the emergence of super apps, such as Mercado, Libra, and, and Rappi. Uh, when we look to the West, US, Europe, and UK, it's long been discussed whether super apps can develop or not. 
Reportedly, PayPal wants to become the first one. Plus, there's also others such as Revolut, self-described as a financial super app, and arguably Amazon. Um, these days, it's worth emphasizing, you're more likely to download a wallet from an app store than pick it out from a shop. Uh, and it's also worth kind of throwing in some numbers. CB Insights are suggesting that the mobile wallet sector alone is currently worth a trillion dollars and is estimated to grow to over seven trillion by 2027. So clearly a burgeoning market. Um, so to my panelists, uh, before we dive into some sort of pointed questions, perhaps, let's first agree on some definitions. Uh, what is a super app versus, say, a super wallet? Um, and perhaps if you can just weave in um, the, the, the discussion around whether it's helpful or not to compare the East uh, and West uh, when, we, when we're having a discussion around these, uh, these platforms. So let me kick off with, uh, with our friend Amit first uh, before we hand over to Steve and Simon. Amit, over to you, sir. Thank you, Dawal. So when you start thinking about super apps, I think it is <laughs> super apps really is an ecosystem of apps or functionalities that caters to a range of customer life needs or life moments. Predominantly, and, and I think Helen has talked about this before, predominantly they are focused on two types of functionalities, <clears throat> payments and financial services, uh, i.e. cashless payments, mobile payments, investments, insurance, loans, QR codes, space payments, et cetera or they are providing a, or supporting a range of retail life moment needs, movie tickets, food and grocery, transport booking, hotel booking, e-commerce, et cetera. And I think it's the unique combination of all of these is what we are referring to as a super app here. Uh, and, and maybe, you know, there's, I would like to add a bit of a fact here that the term super app was actually introduced by a chap called Mike Lazardis, who was the founder of BlackBerry. And that was the first time when this, when this was originally coined and BlackBerry was intended and had the vision to become the super device or super app. But all of us know that that vision hasn't matched up with reality due to multiple reasons. But it's, it's, you know, you would think of super app as an umbrella app providing a full ecosystem of services shaped around lifestyle needs uh, and possibly heavily focused around wallets. So going back to your original question, I think super wallets are a subset of super apps, uh, but a very, very integral feature there. Thank you for that opening, uh, Amit. Um, Steve, some initial thoughts from you, sir. Yeah, I think, I mean, Am Amit said it quite well that super wallets can be seen as a subset of super apps, right, which which are perhaps more focused around the lifestyle or the, the, the non-financial needs, whereas um, a wallet it kind of inherently is trying to be the, the hub of, of money, right, the controlling the controlling source of someone's, someone's uh, uh, funds or, or money. So a, a super wallet may tie together parts of these lifestyle needs, but, but is kind of inherently based around uh, that hub of money and financial services, right? Whereas, a, in theory, a super app could could involve that, could not involve that, um, depending on, on on what they're trying to sell for. Um, so, I I think it's like slightly semantic sometimes, and 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 very very blurred lines. Most of the major super super apps we talked about at the start offer wallet type services as well. Um, so so slightly semantic, but uh, that kind of financial and non financial needs is is a very good way to to split it. I think. Thank you, Steve. Uh, and, and exactly, it is very much semantic, but it's probably worth emphasising these every so often, uh, just as a refresher. Um, Simon, can I get your thoughts on, on your views on the definition? And perhaps also, perhaps, can you kind of share with us, because I know this is your space, why would a brand want to build out a super app? You know, what, what are their drivers and motivations? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, a super app is. I mean, in in China and elsewhere, there it's sort of you do nearly everything on your life within one app, because in that those parts of the world they didn't have other mature apps or other infrastructure, either digital or non digital. So some very clever companies who had a an initial popular service, whether it was like Alipay with payments or it was um, it was uh, WeChat with a chat um, platform. Um, had sticky customers and they wrapped around that financial services and then they wrapped around other services and they integrated them all together and made it very easy for you to access them using one ID and one payment mechanism in one place. 
So they, when those who were successful took off like mad because there wasn't a lot of alternatives. Now, why would a brand maybe in the West want to become like a super app is because those companies are extremely powerful. Um, the more services that you offer, typically, as long as they're relevant and they meet an unmet need, then you spend more time with that brand. And the, the principle behind a, a super app is that you as a company or a brand don't have to create all the services yourself. This is a platform business model where you act as an intermediary between your customers who want solutions, your own internal organization that can create a certain number of solutions, and then a wide range of third parties that you orchestrate, combine with your own solutions to, to solve problems for your customers. And if you can do that, and if it tends to mean customers spend more time on your app in your environment, then they're more loyal you, you monetize third-party services as well as your own, so you increase your, the, the lifetime value of customers and you reduce churn. And your cost of customer acquisition is tiny for these new services because they're already you know, customers of yours. So what that does, it creates a better business model, higher lifetime value, lower cost of customer acquisition, better business model, yes, please. And now... Technology is advanced, which means all that wonderful innovation that was happening in China because they just had to make it work. That's now possible over here, uh, whereas we, we hadn't created the, uh, I guess we hadn't created the infrastructure to allow that to happen at the same scale. But now fintech is so powerful and other there are other tools now that enable you to integrate third parties really quickly. So my view is that any brand can, which has an app, and that's the medium with which they want to interface with customers increasingly, any super brand should look to create a super app. And it doesn't have to be 100,000 third-party services. It could just be five. And that will make you stickier and increase, uh, you know, increase revenue and increase your over or improve your overall business model. Great. Thank you, Simon. And it's a brilliant segue to, to the next section if you like. Um, Amit, can I come to you? And I know you've been thinking about this long and hard uh, and, and kind of analysing the, the, the what are the right business conditions and the, the frameworks required to allow super apps to be built and scaled. I mean, Simon's mentioned the East and what we could perhaps learn and perhaps be inspired by. We are obviously a very different culture business-wise and societal. Okay, what, are the, what are the conditions that are required? Are they, are we, do we have them? What is required to tweak them? in order to allow super apps to flourish and scale? So I think uh, to answer this question, we might probably have to refer to the conditions in the East where super apps have flourished and, and what were the main reasons. Uh, sorry, I'm in the office room and something that's on called dark probably not seen me moving for a few minutes. Uh, I think first of all, we have to look at the business environment and culture in the East. One of the main reasons why I think super apps have flourished is that East, especially economies like China, Korea, Japan, India, have always based businesses on conglomerates. All of these companies have big conglomerates who do everything from financial services to mining. And that mindset is there where, and, and that translated into, into the digital economy where they said, if we build an app, the app should be able to do a range of, you know, support a range of features and functionalities. I think that is important, whereas in West, we we focus more on specialization. There, there are very few companies in the West who do everything from, as I said, financial services to mining, where this is quite common in India, China, Japan, and Korea. So that I think is a very big factor around why, <clears throat> why, why we are seeing emergence of super apps more in the East rather than West. Uh, second, is, <clears throat> second is, of course, uh, the question of, question of demographics and, and how soon technology became available because in many parts of the East, they almost skipped the intermediary technology generation. You move from very basic technical capability to a society which is you know, highly, which is supercharged with high bandwidth availability, the number of cell phones, et cetera. And we have seen that in countries like Korea where bandwidth is probably, average bandwidth is probably 10 to 15 times of UK 
Um, India, where there is a cell phone, everybody and cell phone and mobile data is still cheap, which has led to evolution of these type of consumer behaviors, which rely on consuming data and, and accessing a range of different things. And, and probably the last, last point to feature on here is scale also. Uh, we touched upon this question of scale. It is easier to achieve scale in an Eastern market where the populations are just bigger in some of these countries. So you could easily get up to 100 million. Uh, whereas, you know, getting to a 100 million customer base in a Western European economy is absolutely impossible because that's more than the population of any European country. So, so I would I would summarize those three those three as the main reasons. One, the business culture and the economic culture in the East, the the scale advantage which East has East has, and and then the leapfrogging advantage which I talked about by the leapfrog day generation of technology and went straight into the mobile generation, and those three are contributing factors to why we saw growth in East. Now, I think, I think to go back to your original question, you know, can we replicate that in the West, some of these things? Yes, but we need to you know, work a bit more to figure out what is the right strategy and approach to, to launch launching super apps in the West. Yeah, thank you very much, Amit. Uh, there's a lot to unpack there. I'm very conscious of time, but we'll probably touch upon some of these things for the second session. I definitely recognize the, the comparison you make in the East. Um, I cover the East. Uh, markets for, for a while, um, and I often would reference Indonesia, which often gets forgotten as a huge market with market penetration uh, at a 250 million uh, population size. Um, Steve, let me come to you um, um, to just perhaps touch upon um, the SME audience. You know, going back to what Amit was saying, you know, we, we specialize here in the West in comparison to an all encompassing approach in the, uh, in the East. You know, the SME audience, which you know very, very well, has a very, a very unique, very in demands and needs. You know, we've got zero that I think you and I talked about as potentially considered a super app. You know, what, what, what's your thoughts around that? What next in the SME space? And are there emergence of, of super apps in, 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 the, in the sort of SMB space? Sure. I think bringing, bringing uh, an example from WISE here could, could help. Um, if you're not familiar with WISE, by the way, we're, we're a global technology company that, that's building the best way to move and manage your money around the world. Um, and our WISE platform uh, looks, looks after allowing banks, business tools and consumer apps to use our infrastructure to offer their customers uh, quality and convenient payments and financial services, but within their own platform. So, so it means we work with many companies that offer a core product. Uh, it could be a chat app or, or use Xero as an example of, of accounting software. Uh, and we help them quickly bring payments and financial services products to their customers. What's interesting about the SMB space particularly, um, when we talk about super apps and all of these things, we often think about this like consumer use case, uh, the Alipays and WeChats. But there's a, there's a real interesting angle here for, for small businesses um, and larger businesses. Businesses really value convenience. They want to manage their business from, from one hub, not, not jumping between different tools, uh, which is much easier for, for a consumer. Um, you know, switching from my, my NatWest banking app to my Nutmeg investment app, it's pretty easy for me to do on my phone and quickly send money from one to the other and, and invest. It's, it's not too hard for me to manage a couple of tools like that. But when you try and do that as a, as a business, that becomes really hard. Uh, you need to have the right you know, accesses set up in both apps. On your banking, you might have dual approvals needed for, for people to move uh, uh, approved money movements across. Um, for even larger businesses, you know, you're going to assess multiple vendors and have security concerns around different ways people can access your, uh, your, your business. So, so in this business space, a, a super app, if we want to term it like that, actually makes a lot more, more sense to, to bring all of the tools, all of the uh, things businesses are trying to do together in, in one place and allow that business to manage, uh, run their business from one, from one hub. And Xero is a good example um, as, as an accounting software. Um, they have great visibility on your cash flows, the bills you've received, when you owe money to people, but, but they didn't before offer a payments product. So you had to leave Xero and go to your bank to pay, to pay your bills. Uh, but Wise Platform now powers that bill pay experience inside Xero. 
So business can select the bills they want to pay, make payments and do all that without leaving, without leaving zero, which is incredibly convenient. Uh, you don't need to pay and come back and all, do all the reconciliation and everything again. Um, so I think we will see more of that in the small business space, more um, platforms like Xero, who have a huge marketplace already, but, but many, many others as well, uh, build in tools that allow a more holistic management of your business around the core product uh, feature, which whether that's accounting software or something else. Uh, we'll see a lot more of that and embedded finance within that as, uh, as, we, co as we go along. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. Um, I'm just very conscious of time. We will talk about, we've got, a, we've got the panelists join us again for the second session where we'll talk about the dominance of a small number of super apps in the West versus perhaps more realistically, a collection of them for specific audiences, specializing for specific kind of demographics as touched upon by, by, uh, by, by Steve there. So uh, let, me, let me thank the uh, panelists for now. Uh, you, they will return for, the, for session number two uh, after the after my fireside chat, um, right. Let's move on to the next uh, next section, which is around data security and the challenges. Um, with a wide reach uh, and daily touch points, the, the the super app, digital wallet, financial super app category, uh, however you want to describe them, uh, will have a substantive impact on the day to day lives of individuals and business owners. But only if these new solutions can deliver on scale, convenience, and of course reliability. Um, privacy, data, trust, and security will be crucial uh, in ensuring customers and regulators are confident data is secure and only used when required. Um, we've just heard earlier um, the need for the right conditions for super apps to be created here in the West, UK, US, and, and Europe. Um, so let's expand on the crucial areas of data security and regulation uh, when developing and using a super app. Kindly joining me uh, now is, is Philip James, partner at Evershed Sutherland. Uh, Phil is an expert in data privacy, cybersecurity, uh, and information rights. Um, Phil, I hope you're there with us. Uh, <laughs> I am, I am. There you are, so good to see you. Uh, so let's just kind of go for the jugular. What are the, what are the key issues, challenges, and opportunities for creators of and suppliers to sort of the super app uh, space? Well, I think, I mean, it was uh, just picking up on the, the, the um, points that Steve made earlier before we sort of get into this it's obviously good to get a feeling for what environment you're in and what the audience is and it's a really important distinction to, to draw between B2C apps and B2B apps and B2B to C apps because all of this does have a, a large bearing on the prevalence of the brand and, and whether uh, these apps are white labeled or not I if you've got a you know, uh, technology or platform you rely on how visible is it to the user, because that, to a certain extent, determines um, you know, who might have control over some of the data. Um, and clearly, if we're you know, dealing with consumers and personal information, privacy is right up there uh, about how you manage that. And actually, I actually had a conversation yesterday um, with a corporate lawyer in the US who was saying that you, know, you obviously need to, often was um, working with colleagues who advised on regulatory issues and compliance issues, and it, it took, I don't know, sort of 20 percent of the time on on deals and things but unfortunately now or fortunately depending on which way you look at it uh regulatory and compliance is some of the most you know the lion's share of some of the deals because it's so important to for trust and because of you know, it enables and facilitates the sharing of data um so although you know it's a it's to a certain extent it's an onus um what it does is it facilitates not only data exchange but, but deal flow and empowers businesses to do what they want to do so and that obviously then comes down to you know if you're looking to develop businesses and increase multiples upon exit you know um, there isn't an investor now that's not going to be looking very hard at compliance and regulatory and um, it's not just about sort of the fine side of things but if you if you think about um, you know how it may affect a multiple if you were to exit um, if you were to get a fine for example from a regulator whether it be a data protection regulator or financial services regulator and you have five of let's say let's pick a number two million pounds and that hits your 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 bottom line if your multiple is 10 you can do the math to work out it's going to cost you 20 million potentially in 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 the value when you come to sales so it it's important in terms of the, you know, the commercial contractual ongoing 
uh, data exchange and, and how you work out you know, uh, calculation of fees and, and make sure you're compliant who owns a customer. But it's, it's equally as important to possibly the end game for companies if they, if they are looking to exit and what investors are looking for. Yeah, that's a very good point regarding the uh, the, the, the the kind of endpoint um, and the exit strategy. Um, you mentioned regulatory or the regulation kind of um, framework. Um, in your opinion, do we? I say we. I mean, I mean the West. Uh, do we have the right regulatory policies and frameworks in place to be able to, uh, I guess, strike that right balance, allowing these super apps to flourish and develop and create, whilst also ensuring that. You know, the customer is protected. I think um, I don't think we can ever say we've got the right regulatory frame, policies and frameworks in place because we're always looking to improve. I think whenever there's innovation, there's always people who say, "Oh well, the laws." Ne- it's always off the pace. The law is always off the pace. You know, we're always playing catch up, uh, and that is true to a certain extent. Um, and and people leverage some of those gaps in the law or loopholes to 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 get commercial advantage. But what I would say, some of the overriding principles um, of laws, whether they be new or old, can still be applied to new business models. Um, and the sort of the theme now is, of course, you, you can have innovation and regulation. Then they're, they're not mutually exclusive. And actually, if you're doing stuff really well, you are innovating and you're being compliant. And actually, you take the sort of the top of the list of all of the sort of regulatory frameworks, right at the top, really, and that's the last test you might apply, is, is the ethical framework. And you know, people on the whole, and they maybe you know, think well. Actually, even though even though this is compliant, is it right? You know, should we be doing this even if it's lawful? And of course, that comes up in all sorts of in uh, in, in um, contexts where you know, if something's tax efficient and stuff, well, you might have minimised tax, but how how does that affect the communities you operate in? And how does it affect the vulnerable? Um, um, but going back to the point about the sort of B two B models and B two C models and things. How visible the brand is does, I think, have a useful bearing or a signpost as to whether a brand or, or you know, one of the parties in that supply chain should have a right to use the data. Because I think if you're a user and you're, you're not seeing that brand in the UX, in the interface, you're obviously going to ask the question, well, hang on, how, how, come, how come that company has my data? I didn't even know they're involved in the supply chain. So if, if the brand isn't visible, you then need to sort of work a bit harder to explain in your whatever it may be, uh, fair processing notice or, or you know, so you explain how data is going to be used. Now all comes down to trust. Um, so when we're talking about security, I think often people think about security, they think about cybersecurity, but security is, is just applicable to how an organization uses its customer's own data as it is to a hacker. So it all, and it all comes down to trust. If you can do that really well, trust your relationships, Obviously, a key for, for business development. It, it's 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 absolutely also key to making sure you get a a loyal um, customer base. Absolutely, and we we talked about this before. I mean, in very simple terms, at least from my side, is around transparency. It's crucial uh, from the outset, ensuring customers are asked the right questions at the right time uh, and are clear on what they're signing up to, uh, which is I suspect what you're referring to. Um, but just just one thing that I, I know you've kind of flagged this up to me before, but. Uh, and we don't have a huge amount of time for the, the, the EU Data Act. Um, you've kind yeah. of, you flagged it up. Can you just briefly mention that uh, for full audience and, and what that means to the to this particular topic, but perhaps wider? Yeah, I know. Um, in terms of the regulatory frameworks we got in place, and some people will already be fully aware of these. There's obviously data privacy, and there's financial services regulation, information security, um, you know, the cyber directives, and then you've got um, CMA regulating competition. And you can have dominance in relation to data sets as well as particular markets, uh, payments regulator, uh, Ofcom, what have you. So you've got sort of now much more collaborative regulatory frameworks. And a lot of these regulators, are, the trend we're seeing is that they're all working together. So they're not working in silos. So, you know, they're sharing information about behaviors and, and, and what they're seeing, um, which you know, and it's all about good, good outcomes for consumers and, and businesses. Um, in, relation to, in, in relation to open banking, of course, Open banking is all about making sure there is a fair level level playing field for the CMI, CMA nine, opening up that data to be a more competitive environment. And that was, I suppose, the 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 leader in demonstrating this open data economy. But what the EU Data Act doing, and it's only only a proposal at the moment, and it's it's not in force. But it's actually taking that one step further. Is it's not just applicable to 
open banking and finance, but it's actually saying, listen, everyone needs to open up these data sets so that we can make sure we can facilitate the digital economy. And, and what it actually is, including it in there, is that if you have specifically onerous terms that restrict people about how they can use their data, and this is not just consumers, but data sharing agreements between businesses and enterprise, that that may be deemed to be unlawful. And then if it's unlawful, you're then in, you know, the actual fines are sort of akin to the fines you might have in a GDPR or what have you. So there is a, you know, not only are businesses looking to share data amongst themselves, the legislative frameworks are promoting the sharing of data and actually making sure that this is done in a fair, fair way. So it's, it, it's, a, it's a really, really exciting time. Although um, obviously this, there will be some concerns around those who have hold over data um, as opposed to those people who want to get their hands on it. Yeah, more on that and watch this space. Um, <clears throat> you've shared a, a, a link with us, uh, which I'm sure will be, uh, will be used as a follow-up uh, to, with the audience. Um, so thank you for that. Just perhaps a nice segue, but um, you know, around the, the ownership of data, uh, you know, multiple parties, the data points that fuel the super app kind of platform, you know, where, where do we draw the lines of accountability? What's your thoughts around that? I guess they, a lot of these roads lead back to uh, the, the, the kind of policy framework around data privacy and, and the data act that's perhaps coming down the line. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, when I think of data, I tend to sort of uh, partition it into to two types. You've got the, you know, I do a lot of privacy work, so sort of personal information, personal data, often known in the states as sort of PII, elsewhere, different to, definitions of it and then on the other side of the fence you've got the non-personal data so it's just you know it could be account data and uh, doesn't hasn't necessarily got any personal identifying characteristics so in relation to the former category you are dealing about you know privacy issues so you have you got consent to use someone's data or is the lawful basis upon which you can rely upon it and that's so you can actually use it in the way you want to use it um but then you've also got to look at you know in, in terms of the contracts between two parties and the arrangements you have are there any restrictions or usage limitations in, in the relationship? Um, so that's more of a contractual thing. Um, but then on top of that, you have the intellectual property rights in the data set. So um, who, who owns that data or who has the right to use it? Sometimes people get quite hung up on ownership, but actually really what you want is you just need the right to do what you need to do with it. You don't necessarily need to own it. Okay, that may be the, the ultimate thing to own it, but it's, it's just trying to make sure you've clearly thought that out and it's not forgotten about Another thing that people tend to think about, they think, think, think about the existing data sets, but they don't necessarily think about the um, secondary and tertiary data sets that arise out of the use of data. Um, and also clearly the ownership in things like algorithms that are used for AI, you know, if that's developed and it's maybe bespoke ones developed, who, who owns the rights in that as well? Um, and also, you know, who's going to be liable and how, how are the parties going to liaise with one another to make sure they can resolve any disputes? So sort of data sharing agreements you have and, and also working together to make sure you can share data to prevent fraud. Because of course, there's a lot of fraud, unfortunately, in these sort of spaces. And uh, we've seen in relation to things like automated push payments and what have you that people are being duped to, to make payments. So whenever there's innovation, unfortunately, the, the fraudsters are there and uh, looking, looking to find the loophole. So just got to work hard to, to try and challenge and, and counter that. I think that's a, that's a discussion all in itself, I think, around fraud. But... Um... Yeah, I, I think notwithstanding the huge benefits that super apps uh, bring, um, it does sound like it's Pandora's box to me uh, in terms of uh, in terms of data and privacy. But that's why we need people like you to make sure uh, your, your customers are are, are staying are on track. Um, let's talk about the the where we potentially could be going uh, with the West, in the West vis a vis with with the East. The dominance of a small number of super apps. Yeah, from your perspective. Perhaps it's raising raised concerns around antitrust competition concerns. You know, there's um, we won't name names, but you know, there's a number of big players that are agitating in this space. Perhaps not necessarily with the consumers in mind, but are, are looking to fend off competition. That aside, your thoughts feel around antitrust competition. What what what, what what's the industry talking about in that in that respect? Well, I think um, we've got some particular challenges here, because I think. Um, some of the large companies especially are getting the type of dominance and data that we've never seen before and, and uh, defining what that market is and defining how competition or antitrust law can make sure there's still a level playing field is, is, is still tackling with that. And, and open banking has been one of the, you know, the best examples of that, you know, and, and even then it's 
had some challenges, but I think there's been made great strides and, that, and that's now being expanded to other non-payment industry sectors. But I think it is worth, and, um, worth pointing out, I am not an antitrust lawyer. So I've got colleagues who are far better at this than me, but I would thought I'd do to explain this sort of very quickly, the sort of basic principles of, you know, what is potentially anti-competitive. And there's sort of three or four things you'd look at. You'd look at abuse of a dominant position. So it could be one person has a particular, one organization that has a particularly strong position in, in relation to data sets. And of course, there's any number of we can think of that, think of in that space. Um, then you've got arrangements between two or more parties, whether they're competitors or not, um, that, that are likely to prevent or restrict competition. And um, actually, in the, in the olden days, that was sort of the, the conversations that went on the golf course, where people did agreements between themselves uh, and, and sort of split up markets and things. And then you've got where, in an M&A context, where you're acquiring a company, are you um, getting a dominance in a, in a particular market that could have an unfair and prejudiced effect on, on other competitors? And even then, when, despite all of those things, the regulators, you know, being a bit generalist, not rather than sort of be too UK focused, but um, they, they sometimes have a sort of blanket right to actually look at particular markets just if they think there's something anti-competitive going on. Now, that's a little bit more of a, a broader right and hasn't necessarily been used so much. But I think um, in relation to, to, to data, um, people just need to be very alive to the fact that it, you know, often they think of privacy, but they don't always necessarily think of antitrust and competition. And it's important to make sure that that even if it's ruled out that um, one thinks carefully about if you are putting restrictive covenants and things in agreements with one another, they may be fine, but are there other ways to achieve it that, that may be uh, you know, potentially you know, not full file competition regulation, such as things like in, um, you, using intellectual property uh, uh, licenses, uh, for example, copyright and, and database rights to use certain things and have certain limitations around the use of that data. And that is viewed a little bit more favorably by regulators because actually intellectual property law allows that, whereas um, competition law doesn't. So it's thinking about how one drafts and frames these agreements to make sure you achieve your commercial aims. Fabulous, thank you, Phil. Um, I've got a whole host of questions here, but I think we might have run out of time, but perhaps you can join us for the, for the second panel uh, and the last panel, but uh, that was hugely uh, uh, useful. I'm sure for the audience who I'm aware are also looking into this space and looking to develop their own super app products. So uh, Phil, Phil, thank you very much for this session. Um, let me move on to the next one and our final session. Uh, I'd like to welcome back the panelists and, and Phil as well. Um, for this session, we'll touch upon consumer behaviors, uh, personalizations, the risk and benefits for, for customers. Uh, Phil's just touched upon a number of those areas, particularly around risk and regulation and around data privacy. Um, can I bring Steve into this, uh, uh, into, into this for the first uh, question, uh, if you don't mind? Um, a fundamental question, really. Is, is the consumer demanding an all-singing, an all-dancing app to look after his or her entire banking, financial and other needs? You know, is, is the Western consumer receptive to a super app? I think... Customers just uh, expect better experiences, really. And that's true of, of financial services, but also also any product, right? Um, but particularly in financial services, that's because often the experience of banking uh, lags behind where some other services have got to. Um, today, you know, you can send a, an email in seconds for free. You can click a button on your phone and have any food from all over the world at your door in 15 minutes in, in major cities. Uh, the the old world services that that still many banks do do amazing things, but many banks provide some some quite old school services still that can be slow or pricey. Um, you know, sending money overseas, for example, with your bank still takes days and can cost a lot of money, and and funds can go missing along the way. Uh, consumers don't don't accept that anymore, and they they know the quality bar and standard bar that they can get from other from other services. So. I think whether that's a, an all singing, all dancing app, as, as, as you put it, or or, or not, uh, is is almost secondary. But it's um, uh, customers do expect more, and if that happens to be offered to them by a, a tech super app, then 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 so be it. Um, if that's integrated with other services, so be it. But but does it solve the customer problem? Is going to be the fundamental uh, question that consumers ask themselves. And you touched upon Steve earlier with regards to the SMB market. You know they are simply looking for convenience. You know, they have very unique challenges in comparison to a consumer uh, with all the things they're grappling with. 
uh, when they really just simply want to focus on delivering a good product or service to their customers, correct? Absolutely, yeah, 100%. Great, thank you, Steve. Simon, can I bring you in? Um, and we touched upon this earlier around uh, the dominance of smaller super app players within specific verticals um, versus perhaps a, a fragmentation of, of kind of super app, small less that are speaking to a specific audience, specific uh, kind of demographic. You know, what, what are you foreseeing? Uh, in, in, and this is particularly in the West. Well, I already said that every app and brand wants to be more sticky to their customers. So adding more services on that are relevant not having to create them yourselves, but orchestrating others to create them and doing this so in a way that they're complementary to your core service and drives demand for your core service is the key. So every brand with an app, not every brand, will need to make that app more super. So that is the bottom line. And you, very few are going to be the scale of Alibaba or, you know, or Alipay or the others. They don't have to be. Just if you add a few other services from third parties and create a platform business model where you're not having to take on all the risk of invention to serve your customers, that is the way to rejuvenate your business model and make it fit for a digital world, which we're all operating in. So from my point of view, every brand which has an aspiration to be a super brand, one that is used a lot by many people, needs a super app. Yeah, I love that. Every brand needs to, needs to be, have, a, have a super, even if it's a small S. I think that's, that's, uh, that's definitely seems to be the direction of travel, in, in, certainly in our markets. Uh, Simon, can I keep you here and then I'm going to come on to Amit around sort of the personalised, tailored approach to, 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 to delivering services to, to, uh, to customers. It, what, what, I mean, we, we're obviously seeing what's happening in the sort of the AI-powered financial assistance and robo-advisory space. There's lots of examples, incumbents and small players. Uh, then uh, conceivably that will then evolve into lifestyle super apps end-to-end. -end. You know, what, what's your take and what are you seeing in terms of that hyper-personalized approach that perhaps some brands are, are, are kind of exploring? Simon, is that, can you hear us? Amit, why don't you want to take that question first? Sorry, who are you talking? Who are you asking uh, it to? I was asking you, Simon, but yeah. oh, Amit was talking, but he's on, on mute, I think. Amit, over to you first. Sorry. All right, brilliant. So, absolutely, I think personalization is core to building super apps, uh, and I agree with Simon that it will be very, very difficult to replicate something like WeChat in the West just because of the sheer scale and you know what they did and it's, it's, it's quite unique. I think what we'll see is a lot of super apps catering to different segments. When we talk about different segments or different customer personas, we will talk, we'll, we'll have to you know, start thinking about personalization. Uh, here, I would start to think that open banking, open finance and open data will start becoming very relevant because what you see happening with all of this is availability of a lot of data, which means that there is cross industry data available. This will allow other industries to leverage, this will allow a telecom industry player to leverage banking data or vice versa. And that will, that will result in the creation of you know, richer features for their customers, whatever they are serving, which in essentially will be a super app for that customer segment. So, so absolutely, I think personalization, personalization, need for personalization, having more focused offerings for specific segments will, will be key to growth of super apps. And I think we talked about this before and Steve talked about zero. I think, I think, I think zero is a great example of something which is very, very segment focused to the S for the SME segment and is really a super app because what it does is helps a business, helps small and medium business to, to run the end-to-end -end affairs of you know, what their company is supposed to do, you know, help me to run my business. Yeah, well, what's interesting is that those types of platforms that have a daily interaction with customers, like the accounting packages, or even the, the vertical B2B um, operational software businesses, they know ahead of time what their customers might need because they're seeing data in real time and so in terms of being able to offer lending or insurance or other types of financial services, they're in a much better position to do that than 
the bank or the insurance company themselves, because they can see in real time that the company is, for example, taking on lots of employees or expanding, increasing its inventory and so on. So they, they get those, those, those prompts or they, they get those, those see those trigger points and they can make prompts to the customer and saying, we see you're, you're expanding like this. Here is some uh, very uh, relevant financial service to help you in your growth or what you're trying to do or to cover, cover insurance or risk needs as well. And that, in terms of that sort of beyond personalization, that sort of knowing in advance what a customer might actually need. So the data, and of course, all the open banking data makes it even richer, plus AI will be able to match services to end users' needs much more effectively. And if you are that intermediary between uh, customers, they're using your service on a, on a regular basis, then you're in this golden, opportunity, in golden position to orchestrate third-party services, whether they're financial services or others, uh, at the right time in the right way um, to serve your customers. Yeah, that, that predictive nature of foreseeing where your customer is, is, is heading, I think it's incredibly powerful based on the huge amount of data points that, uh, that these intermediaries, as you described, Simon, uh, are, are harvesting and, and analysing. Um, Phil, can I just quickly bring you into this, if you don't mind, just, just your, your take on sort of this personalised or hyper-personalised space from a, from a data perspective, privacy, any thoughts from yourself? Yeah, I mean... Um... The risk is is considerably greater, of course, in relation to consumers, uh, because consumers are generally have greater protections for them, which which makes sense as opposed to businesses. Not that um, personalization doesn't apply to businesses as well. It, it, it does. But in terms of the risks and benefits, well, also the, the benefits, I think, are a bit more straightforward. But um, the risks, I think, you know, the type of um, risks that we're aware of in relation to personalization is, um, and I think it's useful to talk about consumers because it's, it's a, um, a clearer example is, you know, if you build up a profile of a user and you, and you can, uh, on the one hand, you may target loan products or credit at those potentially who are more vulnerable, um, those who, who you know, um, are challenged by, you know, paying their energy bills or what have you. Um, and of course, there's very successful apps of, of, you know, who are helping to, uh, and they're very useful in a lot of ways, and the, the likes of Klarna and whatever, who are doing really great things, allowing people to purchase things they wouldn't be able to purchase, which is a, a great benefit. But of course, it's just getting the right balance and also making sure that there's, you know, should those be regulated? Shouldn't they? Shouldn't they be regulated? And 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 if they are regulated, what's what's the extent of the regulation? And then on the flip side of that, you've got, you know, those people who who perhaps um, are more fortunate and and have a uh, a healthier financial status, and then that they may end up being charged more for the same thing. Uh, and some people may say, well, that's fine, you know, but um, there's obviously sort of fair trading and and how ethical some of these things are. So um, there are there are great things to, to personalization but it's just trying to get that right balance and i think you know going back to ethics uh without overemphasizing it um often you can you know i'm not saying it's the first test you should make but you, know, you could look at the various other regulations and, and seeing whether something's compliant but always always do think about that ethical test as well because that also comes back to the brand and um you know how is that going to be perceived by your uh enterprise customers or your consumers Thank you, Phil. Um, I see there was a question posted on chat. Amit, um, do you want to just take yourself on, uh, put yourself uh, on mute, perhaps answer that question? You have answered it, but perhaps you want to just uh, articulate a bit more. Yes, um, I think the question which was asked here was around should super apps be launched as a new all-in-one unified <laughs> product or should it be an amalgamation of existing product solutions? <sighs> I mean, based on precedence, based on the evolution of super apps, we've seen that nobody actually intended to launch a super app in the first place. It's something which has happened through evolutionary process and that is important. Uh, of course, if you have infinite amount of money, resources, and time, you could do that. You could you know, launch this all singing, all dancing app, which does anything, every, everything for everybody. But in reality, the approach in the market will be incremental build up of features and functionalities with a clear roadmap and strategy, which ultimately will lead you to a vision of launching a super app in the market. Yeah, it's that iterative, iterative approach, which is, uh, which is clearly, I think, the much more sensible approach, I think. Thank you, Amit. Um, I'm just very conscious of time. We've got a few minutes, perhaps, sir, perhaps some last thoughts from everyone. I mean, I can see you on my screen, so perhaps some last thoughts and uh, 
views from yourself uh, for, for the audience? So I think the point point to raise is raise is, and I think I think one of the things which I've been grappling with is we talk about different industries, financial services, telecom, retail, uh, utilities, etc. Do we think that with super apps evolving, the boundaries across industries will blur? And I think that may be the case. So you wouldn't know, you know, is this a financial services industry problem or a telecom industry problem or a retail industry problem? And this is what I'm trying to you know, figure out. And you know, what does it mean for the overall economy? What does it mean for rules, regulations, et cetera? Because our rules and regulations are currently framed around certain industries, whereas super apps by nature are becoming increasingly cross-industry. So perhaps a closing thought, and I don't have an answer to this, is what does it do to, to, to everything that we understand in terms of rules, regulations, uh, et cetera, within the super app space? Do we need to actually evolve a new set of rules for this cross-industry players, which will, uh, which will you know, stop some of, some of the monopolistic trading practices, which might happen through the evolution of some of these, these apps? Some great questions, open any questions as well. Amit, thank you very much. Um, Steve, um, some final thoughts from you. Yeah, I think like like in, in, in any space, the, the winners are gonna be those that that provide the product that solves their customers problem the best. Um, and it doesn't like like Amit said, it doesn't really matter who provides that, your bank, your telco, your your shopping website, or your social network, but but does this solve the problem? It's, it's nearly impossible for one company to build every feature uh, that, that every customer might, might want or, or, or need. So the only way to achieve that is, is through partnerships and whether that's in financial services and, and payments like, like we do or, or in, other, in other spaces, that partnerships, getting that right from uh, solving the problem, uh, the data points Philip talked about, the commercial points, does this make sense for, for both parties is, is going to be key. So, um, yeah, definitely, definitely a, a, an increase in the number of partnerships between um, between companies to better solve their customers' problems, um, and the person that does that will will win in this space. Thank you very much, Steve. Simon, can I hear can I hear your thoughts? Uh, and perhaps you can also weave in a an answer to this question as well that's just come through, if you don't mind, uh, around do payments or messaging uh, need to be at the foundation? Uh, on top of which everything else is built for a super app. Yeah, well, those are, if they are successful, those are very popular services and they're used very, very regularly. So that puts you in a very good position. You're interacting with your customers the whole time. So that's why those, those types of services tend to have been the starting point because people are using those products the whole time. Um, so for a brand that is trying to stay relevant with its customers, it needs to create or make sure that its core product is more popular so it can add on payments capabilities to its own service, like we heard from Zero and others and those accounting packages who are adding their own payments capabilities. Retailers have been doing that for some time as well. Um, but most brands need to get into the payment stream in some way. But fintech is now so powerful that nearly anybody can do that because it's possible, whereas in the past it wasn't. So my, my final thought would be that technology, particularly financial technology, is enabling things that we never thought were even possible uh, before. And so what seemed difficult and hard and expensive and time consuming is now not. And so my point is that any company with, a, with ambition uh, can use, or let's say adopt and adapt the, the business models of the super apps to help them create a better business model that's fit for the future. Thank you, um, Simon, and thank you for answering that question as well. Uh, finally, Phil, final, final thoughts from you, sir. Uh, I was actually just going to throw in um, a recent example, which just actually popped up, popped up in my feed, which um, I think is really interesting. It's about um, if you're um, a part of a credit through credit score, um, they're, they're, they're offering a sort of incentive at the moment whereby if you share your open banking data, you'll get 1% off your APR in terms of your loan. Now that's a really interesting proposition here because actually you know, that's the sort of data exchange point is that you're not, you know, customarily people often uh, ask for consent potentially for shared data, but where you're getting a, a benefit like that is a great, you know, thing about consent, of course, you can, you can always withdraw it, which is problematic. So um, you wouldn't want to necessarily give someone 
the one percent off um if they then just remove their data literally the next day or the consent but i think that's where you're looking at you know, possibly different lawful bases you know is it, is it the purpose of the contract um the basis of 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 the of the loan agreement for example that you have that you know it's it's a condition that you share the open banking data and of course there's good justification for that but this is a really good example of just being innovative and sort of thinking outside the box and making sure that actually there's a quid pro quo here and and the same happens sometimes with marketing for you know showing data to receive emails or texts or whatever it might be you know what what's in it for the consumer and as long as they know how the data is being used and they can be informed and consider it i think you're in a much better place it's when you try and sort of sweep it under the carpet and, and 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 you get a bit excited about oh we've got access to data should we just use it that's when you're starting to um cross the line and uh, find yourself in a trickier spot uh, which goes back to the point you were making about ethics phil thank you very much um <clears throat> Thank you uh, for your final thoughts. Uh, I think some great insights there. Lots and lots of open questions. It's a space that is burgeoning. Uh, we watch this space. We're watching the tech giants and the big brands. We're all so excited about the, the smaller, uh, more perhaps niche products that are coming uh, down the track. Uh, and as was said, every brand perhaps needs to have a super app, uh, perhaps with a small S of, of some degree. Um, Again, gents, thank you for all your time today, uh, your expert views. It's been a pleasure listening to you uh, and hosting as well. Um, hand over back to you, Helen. Wow, Deval, the time just gallops past, isn't it? It, it flies. Yeah, it's got to be uh, a, a, the best uh, testimony. It really, really has. Um, I actually always get a lot of comments on, on WhatsApp. And let me tell you, uh, this is a topic that... Um, people are really engaged with. I can honestly say that our panel has inspired people, uh, maybe not to go out and uh, you know develop a super app, but what, I, what I'm hearing, I'm, I'm sorry, what I'm reading is that people are, are actually now thinking how they can partner with other people in the ecosystem, that's the, the wonderful open banking ecosystem, to, um, uh, to, to, to collaborate and start creating um, uh, their own uh, super app with a little S, Deval. So I'll, I'll take that, that away with me. So that all that um, remains is for me to thank you for being such a brilliant host. Um, we promised we would do it. So please, um, let's not leave it so long for the next time. Absolutely wonderful. We will see you at Money 2020. I'm looking forward to that. Um, and to thank our team of experts. Um, Simon, as always, it was an absolute pleasure. Uh, Steve, I know that um, my nephews uh, adore your product and it has been an absolute a delight to hear more about what you do on, on, on the platform as well. Um, Phil, um, feedback has, has been tremendous um, on that um, and Amit, um, absolutely brilliant. Um, and um, I will have made a note of the... Um, of where the uh, origins of super app came from and that for anybody that is watching and has got good retention will be in our Christmas quiz. So all that remains for me to do is say a huge um, big thank you to everybody. And also uh, let me just remind you and everybody probably knows this anyway, we will be sharing all of this content on social. So please uh, do, do uh, share it and, and reshare it. Um, what we do see is that it, this has a, a very long tail now and it is viewed uh, for very um, for many months uh, to, to come. It really is um, evergreen in, in the truest definition of it. So thank you again to the panel for investing their time to create that. Um, but allow me to, to say a big thank you to the Open Banking team, my team, who, let me tell you, they work so hard um, behind the scenes to, to make this happen and to make it happen absolutely easily. So uh, thank you, everybody. And last but not least, it'd be very remiss of me not to say, whilst we are still on air for a couple of minutes, please do lift your phone and do make um, that open banking uh, charity donation. You know you want to. So um, thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and the very, very best of health. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye.